The content of this video is for educational purposes. Any decision to revise one's clinical practice is the sole responsibility of the individual clinician. Kind introduction. Just to grab something here. All right. I'm very honored to present this lecture at Vanderbilt University, and I'd like to show you all a little of what it looks like where I practice. So this here is a picture of the beautiful campus that we have on the shores of Lake Mendota in Madison, Wisconsin. It's the University of Wisconsin Medical Center here with the VA Medical Center and Children's Hospital next to it on the shores of the lake. And the title of this presentation is A Basic Tenet of Medicine. Do no harm, right? It's the heart of all we do. And I'll show you today that our basic principles of safe patient care and the principle of economic sustainability do not conflict with environmental goals. Benjamin Franklin said that a penny saved is a penny earned. And this principle of gradual accumulation over time is a shared characteristic of both safety and sustainability. I have no financial disclosures to make, but I am a cheapskate and I'm enthusiastic about conservation of our natural environment. To go over our learning objectives after today's presentation, you should be able to describe how anesthetics affect global warming, incorporate environmentally friendly strategies in anesthesia, formulate a plan to make your OR greener, and explain the financial implications of going green. But first, we have to always think protect yourself. So protect yourself by wearing personal protective equipment in the operating room and whenever necessary. But we're here in this profession because we're here to protect patients. And when we're protecting patients and ourselves, we should also not forget that protecting the environment plays into this in a vital way. And if we do all of these things together, we've achieved the holy grail of healthcare. What is this holy grail of healthcare? This is the quadruple aim. And the quadruple aim, you might ask yourself, what is this lofty goal? It's enhancing the patient experience, improving population health, improving provider well-being, all of these things while reducing costs. And it is, it is, it's very lofty, but it's important to think about what's underlying all the things that we do. Pollution prevention is the new patient safety movement, and climate change is going to be one of the biggest concerns for public health in the 21st century. Air pollution is associated with increased asthma rates and can aggravate asthma, emphysema, chronic bronchitis, and other lung diseases. And the CDC's tracking network calculates that a 10% reduction in fine particulate matter could prevent over 13,000 deaths per year in the United States. Provider burnout is also a real problem and recruitment costs are high, around $500,000 and some estimates even higher per physician. And we should be mindful of our exposure at work to stress as well as harmful chemicals and also that the environment that we live in contributes significantly to our personal health and to the health of our patients. All of this really should be done with cost mindfulness and that doesn't mean that we need to uh, take this at the expense of providers but really a lot of things that we can save on um, go without that. And a lot of people say, oh Karen, that's really adorable that you care about the environment so much. But today I'm taking care of patients and today I have to think safety first. I have a lot of things happening simultaneously and I have to prioritize in clinical situations. And all of that is true and I completely agree. I mean, look at what you have going on sometimes. You've got somebody placing an A-line that you're supervising while somebody else is doing an, doing an airway, somebody else is monitoring uh, for you. All of these things are happening at the same time and it is very stressful. But there are times also when things have settled and there's not much going on. And then you have a moment to think about what else is going on. And it's in those moments that I'm asking people to think about the bigger picture. Speaking of the bigger picture, uh, I like this image from John Lund Photography. It's the tall ship with lighthouse. And I'm going to read to you from the motto of the ASA. So the patient at the, in the ASA is represented as the ship sailing troubled seas with clouds of doubt and waves of terror. The lighthouse acts as a beacon in the night. And the lighthouse is a symbol of the American Society of Anesthesiologists and represents our commitment to safety and vigilance in patient care. And this is really important. This underlies everything that we do. And then speaking of safety and personal safety, I'd like to ask everybody, how much gas are you breathing? This is important to think about every day in addressing cumulative effects. I talked um, in the resident seminar yesterday about how many years everybody plans to practice. And for me personally, I plan to work around another 20 years. 
And if you're a resident, it's probably closer to 30 or 40 years. And do you want to be exposed to breathing neurotoxic, volatile organic compounds every day for decades? Sure, it's safer with waste anesthesia gas scavenging, but what about when you're not in the habit of pausing flows every time you disconnect the circuit? How much gas are you breathing over all of these years? And where are you breathing? And where is the patient exhaling the gas? This is important to think about. And so this brings us to where does the waste gas go? So a lot of people don't even think about this. It's sort of like it's gone. But as we know, nothing is ever really gone. And that's why uh, we have standards in the operating room to protect us. So OSHA guidelines say that we should not be exposed to more than two parts per million of any halogenated agent based on the weight, right? So this happens through waste gas scavenging. And to show you where it goes, this is again our beautiful hospital here in Wisconsin. And I like to point out to my colleagues that we vent the gas ultimately right out the roof of our hospital through the waste gas scavenging system and it gets diluted in the atmosphere. And a lot of people are surprised to hear that, especially when I point out to people, oh, look, you live near the hospital in these fancy neighborhoods, Shorewood Hills or Maple Bluff, they're really beautiful, and you live nearby and you're polluting right there. Uh, and then I like to remind people also of the organic chemistry. Now, we all had to have organic chemistry, so think about what it is that you're using. It's fluoromethyl hexafluoroisopropyl ether. This is one of our most common gases. This is the structure, and it's sevofluorane. I'm looking at this you realize, because you have a history in organic chemistry, at least a little bit, that it's a halogenated hydrocarbon. And related compounds includes things like chlorinated hydrocarbons, like this compound here on the left. This is trichloroethylene. And trichloroethylene uh, was an anesthetic that was used until the 1980s in developed countries, and it was abandoned due, con due to concerns for fetal toxicity and uh, carcinogenic potential. It's also an industrial solvent that was used in dry cleaning and, in, and engine degreasing up until the early 2000s. And it's a precursor in the manufacture of this molecule, which is halothane. And looking at the structure, you realize halogenated hydrocarbons are also chlorofluorocarbons, like this molecule right here, and chlorofluorocarbons, CFC, right? It's like Freon. And then you should be realizing, oh yeah, these things can impact the environment. So inhaled anesthetics, particularly the halogenated compounds, they have a comparative global warming potential to CO2, which is by definition one, as follows. Sevofluorine is 130 times more global warming potential than carbon dioxide. Isofluorine 510 and desfluorine 2,540 times more of a global warming potential than CO2. Nitrous oxide has 300 times the global warming potential of CO2. And the interesting thing about nitrous oxide is that it really persists for a long time in the atmosphere. The atmospheric lifetime of nitrous oxide is 114 years. So if you use nitrous oxide today, it's gonna to be around for generations. The, the atmospheric lifetime of these other molecules, sevofluorine is one to two years, isofluorine is around five, and desfluorine is around 14 years. So this got me to thinking when I learned about this, so what it, I really wanna understand how this works. Um, if you look at the, this picture of the Earth's atmosphere, you see how the Earth gets warmed by solar radiation and it's protected by the ozone layer. And in the ozone layer, if you have nitrous oxide in your atmosphere, nitrous oxide is ozone destructive. And then what about the greenhouse gases? So the main mechanism by which the Earth cools itself is through infrared radiation from the Earth's surface. And the greenhouse gases in the troposphere really trap this infrared radiation and prevent its release, keeping the Earth warm. So that's really interesting. And uh, Solbeck Anderson and colleagues, they studied the infrared spectra or the spectra absorption of um, the various gases, including CFC-11, isofluorine, and sevofluorine. And here in the infrared window, there's carbon dioxide, ozone, and methane. And if you look at the infrared spectra of CFC and then isofluorine and sevofluorine, you can see where they fall right here in the window where uh, the earth cools itself. So you can tell how it can be very uh, impactful for the global warming. So how do they sample this and how do we know what's in the troposphere? Well, air gets sampled at observatories or at, at um, climate research stations and observatories high in the mountains or at remote locations on the earth. And pictured here is in Switzerland at the Jungfrau Joch, the Sphinx Observatory. And they take, scientists take samples of gas uh, from the free tropospheric air that's found at these high elevations. And no, the Swiss don't take samples of it with Elkhorns, but scientists, um, like this is from the Scripps Institute actually, but very similar to there in San Diego, up on the top of the mountain in Switzerland, uh, they take air samples and analyze them for, compound, for content. 
And what's surprising is that volatile anesthetic gases are even detected in these very remote locations. So it's important to think about your gas choice and reducing your flows wherever you can. So this picture here is something that we developed at Wisconsin, which is where we decided, all right, let's try to impact people's choice. So we don't wanna dictate providers feel very strongly about what they should choose, but we can inform them. And we also, we created these labels for vaporizers and you can see they contain a lot of information, but also we wanted to pick a background that made it easy to see what was sort of favorable. And you can tell that the sevoflurane has a much lower impact than the desflurane vaporizer. And we also put a lot of information on these, including the FDA flow recommendations for sevoflurane. And one of our anesthesia techs said, well, we could put a QR code on there and people could scan it, which links to our website that has a whole bunch of publications because you can't really put too much information on a small three inch by one and a half inch label. And then over time, I kept giving a talk about how um, this impacts global environment. And we really saw a reduction in our purchasing of desflurane here, really plummeted over the course of about five or six years when I started giving this talk in 2012. And then sevoflurane increased a little bit, but we also saw with, in, with telling people that the flow doesn't have to be two or greater all the time, 100% of the time, that we didn't see a huge spike in sevoflurane increase. So this is really interesting. And you can believe that this caught the attention of the hospital purchasing when this uh, really was impacted because around $35,000 per month, per month was our average spending on desflurane. And it went down to below $5,000 per month over the course of a couple of years. And because of the negative cost benefit ratio of desflurane, um, we did a survey within our department and found out that not very many people are using it anymore and decided to quit purchasing it in January of this year. We also did an emissions reduction study. So we measured our carbon footprint in 2011 before I started giving talks like this in 2012. And our average uh, kilograms of carbon dioxide output per case was uh, just over 90 kilograms. And then four years later in 2015, it was 56 kilograms per case of carbon dioxide with a big reduction in our dust flooring usage. So this was really interesting. It's a 38% reduction and it re represents every year since 2011, a 4 million kilogram reduction in CO2 output. And that's like taking 875 cars off the road for a year, every year. So that really makes a big difference and made everybody feel really good. And then we continued to reduce. We wanted to see, you know, where can we go next? And our most recent uh, emissions report that I've uh, put out to my department is as follows. We have under 25 kilograms per case output. And then it's important to think about what that is represents. And it's interesting to look at what the gases represent now too. So desflurane is still almost 30% of our emissions in 2018. And I'm gonna look at next year's emissions to see what, um, what impact we have now. So you might say to yourself, okay, that sounds like a lot, but what is you know, 27 kilos per case? And think about how many cases you do. Again, it's the cumulative effect. So your one case that you're doing is maybe not such a big deal, but if you have a habit over many years, and over all of the cases done at your institution, we used to do about 26,000 cases per year in 2011, and now we're over 32,000 cases per year in 2020. And I'm sure that's the case in um, the situation at Vanderbilt as well, that your surgical volumes continue to climb. So our fiscal year dust chlorine emissions alone, which again is close to a third, right, is like 654,000 miles driven in an average car, according to the EPA, it's like 34 million smartphones charged. So that's what our emissions are. And then it's interesting to think of the flip side of this. How could you capture that carbon? What would you have to do in order to mitigate that on the other end? You could offset that carbon dioxide by planting 4,429 trees as saplings and growing them for 10 years. And if anybody's ever planted trees, and I have as a kid planted trees with my dad, and, um, and it's a lot of work slipping that water, you'd have to preserve 315 acres of US forest for a year. So it's a lot to think about what is the carbon that you'd have to do, you'd have to offset. So we propose three steps to lower emissions, which is first of all, choose a greener gas, right? And a lot of people will argue, I, I believe you don't really use desflurane much at Vanderbilt, but people might be proponents of this. And you know, if you use desflurane at even a half a liter per minute, which is very, very low, it still has 6.7 times the CO2 emissions potential of sevoflurane at two liters per minute. And nitrous oxide persists in the atmosphere, again, over 100 years. I can't emphasize enough that the nitrous oxide that you use today is going to be around for a long, long time. Use lower flows overall. Pause flows whenever you can. And now we have modern CO2 absorbers, so you really don't have to worry about compound A. And we can talk about that a little bit, too. 
and avoid volatile agents whenever possible. We're gonna talk about TIVA as well as an option. And regional anesthetic, of course, doesn't use either TIVA or, um, or gases. So what about low flows? So the FDA, even the conservative FDA, says that you can use less than two liters fresh gas flow with sevoflurane if you have a shorter case. And divalent absorbents don't form compound A. So absorbents with minimal or no monovalent bases, potassium hydroxide or sodium hydroxide, are available. So at UW, we use Metazorb, which is 75% calcium hydroxide and 4% sodium hydroxide. And you have no compound A formation with Amsorb, Litholime, or Spiralith. And I believe you guys have Litholime at Vanderbilt. So here is from the APSF newsletter in 2017, a, a table showing the comparison of the various, um, the various compounds, right? And none of these have potassium hydroxide. And Metazorb has a very, very low amount of sodium hydroxide. And according to the APSF newsletter discussion back then, the clinical relevance of compound A in humans hasn't really been demonstrated. Um, and desiccated absorbance, so when you use higher flows, it dries out your absorbent and it is a more risk for formation of compound A and carbon monoxide. Low fresh gas flow actually preserves moisture, and they were saying that 0.3 to less than two liters per minute are safe with minimal sodium hydroxide in your absorbent and no potassium hydroxide. Now, I don't know how many people would feel comfortable going all the way to 0.3 liters, I guess that's really close to a very closed circuit, but um, under two liters is definitely uh, pretty safe. There are some new technologies available and anesthetic gas reclamation and dynamic gas scavenging uh, were developed by Dr. James Berry at Vanderbilt. And the dynamic gas scavenging allows for intermittent use of waste gas pumps as opposed to continuous 24 seven operation, which is really energy intensive and costly for hospitals and reclamation gives an opportunity to capture the gas, because if you know, I mean, we all know that it gets exhaled almost unchanged. Other technologies include Deltazorb by Blue Zone. That's a Canadian company. There are a couple other companies that do this, but this is one of the ones that I was looking for examples of. And they collect the gas in their Deltazorb canisters, and then it gets shipped to the company, and the company then purifies it. They have big storage canisters and facilities that, um, that purify the gas and separate it back out into its components. Because you, as you can imagine, if you use various gases, it's a mixture. And then they send it back to you. And another device uh, that's interesting that's relatively new is the Anaconda. And this is a modified heat moisture exchange device that it connects to the anesthetic circuit and is used in critical care sedation and ventilation. The inhaled agent um, is applied to the device via a syringe pump and rebreathing and conservation of the gas occurs in this, um, in this heat moisture exchange uh, device. And the depth of sedation can be monitored, that's one of the advantages, by, advantages of, um, by monitoring the exhaled um, anesthetic gas levels. So let's take a break now, we'll take a breath, and before moving on to the next section of this talk, and we'll look at this lovely picture from your beautiful state of Tennessee. This is Fall Creek Falls at the Cumberland Plateau. And Fall Creek Falls at the height of 256 feet is one of the highest waterfalls in the Eastern United States. I think that's really interesting. And also I promised Brooke that I would show a CME slide. Uh, so you can text the code 29043 to the number 855-776-6263. And the reason I said that is so that you can't see it, you're on your phone or something like that. And also to give you time to look at it. All right, so let's look at propofol. So what are some advantages of propofol? And I'm gonna talk about it from an environmental and life cycle standpoint. So propofol um, has a far lower greenhouse gas emissions profile than inhaled anesthetics. And the downsides to propofol, however, they do exist, of course. There is required plastic tubing when you run an infusion. And there's potential for water and land contamination for, with the disposal of propofol. And propofol has a PBT score of nine, which means it must be incinerated to avoid water and soil contamination. So what is this PBT score? This is the persistence bioaccumulation and toxicity. And that was studied by Dauk et al. Um, they're a Swedish group. And they uh, were looking at uh, how long do these compounds that we frequently use in medicine exist in the environment? Do they accumulate? So over time, or do they sort of like not, you know, do they not not accumulate, and are they toxic? So what is the toxicity to aquatic animals? So small, um, small animals, not like fish, but like really, really small ones like amoeba and stuff, stuff like that. Um, do they accumulate in these animals? And then propofol really does accumulate and persist in the environment if you pour it directly into water. So you gotta ask yourself, how much propofol do you need? 
right now at, at Vanderbilt, you guys have a lot of ERAS protocols I found out yesterday in the seminar. So the residents are used to drawing up a lot of TIVA infusions and lidocaine infusions, ketamine infusions, but propofol in particular. And um, there was this chart that was um, published by Manx and colleagues showing how much propofol you need, assuming that you have a relatively high um, rate of infusion of 256 micrograms per kilo per minute and based on the weight of your patients. Now, I don't know how you are in Tennessee, but we have a lot of people who are over 80 kilos, but at least it gives you a guideline for thinking of where would you need to get a 50 ml bottle of propofol or how many 20s would you need? So getting a bunch of small ones or do you need a big one? So let's look at a life cycle comparison for the various drugs, right? So this study was done by Sherman and colleagues. Sorry, it's a little bit dark down here, but Sherman and colleagues, they do a lot of life, like life cycle analysis of um, various processes. And life cycle analysis is a comparison that's an industrial standard that looks at the entire cradle to grave process for an entire um, material or drug or something like that. So the mining for raw materials, the transportation and manufacturing costs, where, like if it's, if it's manufactured far away, does it have to get brought to the United States, that kind of thing? What is the packaging situation? Is it heavy? You know, does it, does it cost a lot to carry it somewhere? And um, things like that. So this part of the slide looks at agent release here in pink. So this is the waste phase of desflurane, isoflurane, and sevoflurane. So after its usage, what happens to it? And agent release, this is the carbon dioxide output here. And if you have nitrous oxide as a carrier gas, the nitrous oxide makes it much more, especially for sevoflurane, has a much bigger impact if you combine it with sevoflurane. And what is this small little sliver here in blue? Well, that's the manufacturing phase. So this is prior to use in blue, right? And then drug delivery here in propofol, you have to run electricity to run your pump. So that's a little tiny sliver there. And then for desflurane, because you have to heat the vaporizer, the drug delivery is also associated with some carbon dioxide output. So this is the greenhouse gas emissions here on the x-axis and grams of CO2 uh, per, uh, per different atom. And you can see that propofol has a much lower uh, carbon dioxide overall um, life cycle uh, emissions compared with the anesthetic gases. So let's take another breath. So I've driven through Tennessee a couple of times, uh, most recently on spring break in 2018, and it was quite beautiful to drive through uh, the Great Smoky Mountains. And this is a breathtaking image um, of a natural area near you. And I wanted to ask if you know that the Great Smoky Mountains National Park is the most visited national park in the United States. And it's right near you, this beautiful environmental space. And then we're gonna shift gears to talking about the impact of waste. The United States hospitals produce more than 7,000 tons of solid waste per day. And the cost of waste disposal accounts for about 20% of a hospital's environmental budget and more than 20% of solid waste at a hospital comes from the operating room. And this makes sense to us because we open a ton of, um, actually literal tons of uh, disposable supplies every day. And waste accumulation. So you think about you know, that little pile of stuff that you open at the beginning of the case, the tube, the package, maybe an LMA, a couple other things, some syringes. All of that adds up again for tens of thousands of cases per year and tens of thousands of cases over your career. And then look at the accumulation. We no, almost never have to look at it because environmental services comes and takes it away, but they have to look at it. They look at all these bags that we take out of the OR and they see this accumulation. And we measure this at UW Health and I'm sure that your hospital does too because it costs money. Um, and each operating room in 2019 at UW Health produced 67 tons of waste, every operating room. And we have 27 operating rooms in our main operating room and we have 63 anesthetizing locations across our system. So where does your waste go? So we have, um, we have waste uh, um, management within our county here in Wisconsin, and you can drive right past our Dane County landfill and letting people know that primarily your non-hazardous waste that you produce at your hospital goes to your local landfill is really interesting. So where is your local landfill? I know this and it's happened to be like geeky about finding out where landfills are, but you can look this up. So you can look at solid waste management in Tennessee and you can see it's a very small, I tried to zoom in on Nashville, but it wouldn't let me. So here's Nashville, and you've got different types of landfills right in your area. Um, there's different types of landfills for solid waste, for construction waste, for hazardous waste. Um, and you have to think about what are you doing. And in New England, so of course we're different in Wisconsin and Nashville, we have a lot more open spaces um, than places like New England, but they're running out of landfill space in a lot of states in New England and in Connecticut, they're now incinerating all of their municipal solid waste because they just don't have space for it anymore. And I don't want that to happen to us. 
So we all know about reduce, reuse, recycle, right? But not all things are created equal. The EPA is now uh, advocating for a pyramid. So if you look at proper disposal and rotting, so like composting, things that you can't dispose of and proper disposal, recycling whatever you can't refuse is pretty far down energetically and cost savings wise at the tip of the pyramid down here. This is low, this is low um, energy savings and this is high energy savings. So low energy use, high energy use, right? So opposite, sorry for saying it backwards, but recycling is pretty far down here. It feels very reassuring to recycle, but it's actually not that reassuring. Reuse whatever you can. That's really important to, that's a little higher up on the, on the pyramid and reducing what you do need. So that's why surgical kits are constantly being reformulated. They're looking at, do we need to buy all of these things? And tens of thousands of dollars per operating room can be saved if you have a big reduction in kit and uh, efficient kit reformulation. And if you don't even buy an item, if you never even purchase that disposable device into your hospital, if you don't bring it in, it never becomes a problem. So try to think about like, what do we not even have to get here that we don't have to throw away later? So that's really the best energy savings. And the reason that plastics recycling, um, and we have a lot of plastics, of course we have paper too, but think about most of what we use is really plastics. Um, the global plastics market has really changed and has impacted uh, local recycling significantly. Over here, we have an article from uh, the Financial Times in 2018 evaluating um, the global plastics market. So we used to, in the G7 industrialized nations, send almost all of our plastic to China for recycling. And halfway to through 2017, China said, oh my gosh, we have way too much plastic. And I used to ask myself always, how did my plastic in Wisconsin wind up in the Pacific Ocean? This made no sense to me. Because um, I thought, well, we send it all to our landfill and we have a local recycling uh, vendor. And our local recycling vendor, of course, separates all of that. But where does the plastics manufacturing occur? Of course, the manufacturing occurs overseas in Asia. And so it gets separated and bundled and put on trucks and then on ships. Um, the trucks to the coast and then ships across the ocean to China. Now, of course, we're having to keep our plastic because China won't take it. So the market literally shrunk in 2017 significantly because they just said, that's it, we're not taking anymore. And Malaysia then to follow up, because Malaysia then became the biggest recipient of plastics, they said, oh my gosh, we have too much and it's not clean enough and we just don't know where to put it. We cannot deal with this. So they quit taking it. So a lot of places are quitting taking almost all of the plastic that we produce. Now, number one and number two plastic is still pretty valuable and that still gets recycled pretty easily. Um, so it's important to think about that. So we looked at what we waste. And again, you don't see it. We don't see it too much in your individual case because you walk with your patient, maintaining safety of your patient away from the room to pack you or to the ICU or wherever you're delivering your patient. But our anesthesia materials people and the techs who stock the OR, they really see what we waste. And this bag over here represents one week's worth of opened unused waste um, in the operating room. So if you open two things because you're not sure which sides to use and that kind of thing, um, you leave it there. And because Jayco says it has to be a, a, a monitored chain, right? You can't leave an open supply in the operating room unmonitored. You can't leave it there overnight anymore so you can get into trouble with the, with the site visit if you have that kind of practice. You have to make sure that the chain of, um, of safety and sterility and cleanliness is maintained. So uh, if you set up an OR, for example, you know you have to break it down if you can't have somebody sitting in there making sure that nobody's like touching everything. So um, what we did is we looked at what's in here and there's all kinds of stuff in here, but we wanted to talk, educate people about high impact items. So we really looked at these items and it was so interesting to find out, being my father's daughter, I went through the trash, of course, um, to look at what's in there. And it was interesting to see that the low cost items have the highest impact. So things like an endotracheal tube stylet, now these are 2012 prices, and these things fluctuate a little bit from organization to organization, but this is the order of magnitude of what these things cost. So endotracheal tube stylets are actually more expensive than endotracheal tubes, and we wasted these items. So stylets, pulse oximeter probes, and now we're doing uh, reusable pulse oximeter probes as a standard on every machine because we were finding that people would come from the ICU or the emergency room with a sticker on anyway. And we were opening a sticker in addition because we wanted to be ready. But if you have a clip, you're ready. And if you can't use a finger, you can use an ear probe. Bear hugger blanket, same thing. The nurses were opening a bear hugger because they wanted to keep the patient warm. And uh, we did too. So it was a lot, of, a lot of things. And the least expensive item here, the endotracheal tube on average per month, month over month, was the most wasted item with the highest impact. And that makes sense because if you think about it, if you've got an expensive device in your hand, like a spinal drain or a really expensive kit of some sort, that costs maybe $100 or $400 for a spinal drain or a couple hundred dollars for a, for a bronchial blocker or exchange kit thing, 
right? So all these things are expensive. You're going to be very, very careful with it. If you're like endotracheal tube, that thing's cheap, you know, so I dropped it on the floor. No big deal. I'll get a second one. Now, of course, you should get a clean one if you drop it on the floor, but I'm advocating don't even open it until the patient gets to the room, is what, unless it's a big emergency. So um, think about the power that you have at this point of use when you're using a sterile single-use item. Consider the entire life cycle. So it has big downstream impacts here. This is a picture of our local landfill. You use up landfill space and the landfills can leach out pollutions, uh, pollutants and toxins. And then upstream impacts too. You have a lot of power at that point. If you don't open that device, if you don't use it, the upstream impacts are enormous as well. So mining in naturally sensitive areas for fossil fuels because plastics are petroleum products and then petrochemical processing to produce those plastics really is very energetically um, costly. So if we look at reusable versus disposable, as again, this is Eckelman and Sherman, um, they compared reusable versus disposable LMAs, for example. And they're looking at the entire life cycle again, from the raw material uh, mining to LMA material production, manufacturing in where it gets manufactured for their particular LMA that they use, the usage, single use, and then the, the use LMA and packaging goes to solid waste management. So what is this cost for the disposable LMA versus the reusable LMA, which has similar processes, their reusable LMA happened to be manufactured in Singapore, and then transport distribu distribution and use. And the, use, the reusable LMAs um, are good for about 100 cycles, but they said, let's be conservative and let's estimate 40 cycles. Because you know, it might get thrown away earlier, it might break or something. So let's look at that. And then including the washing and autoclaving for all of the cycles, hiring a person um, to, to go at it with a brush and a soap and towel. And then ultimately the wastewater treatment and solid waste management. And they found that the reusable LMA has a less than 50% ecological impact compared with the disposable and uh, is the reusable is $1.60 per use cost difference. And you might think, oh, $1.60, that's not much, but again, accumulation. So at our hospital, I estimated, so if we do 20 LMAs per day, which I'm sure we do more, times five days a week, 52 weeks a year, that's 5,200 LMAs at $1.60 each, that's easily over $8,000 a year if we properly use our reusable LMAs. Now we have unfortunately gone to primarily purchasing of disposable LMAs because people, again, they were throwing away the reusable LMA too soon. But we're starting to work on education for reusable versus disposables. And the same is true for laryngoscopes. So they, Eckelman and Sherman did uh, a study looking at the, the greenhouse gas emission comparison of blades and handles for single-use steel, single-use plastic, sterilization and high-level disinfection, that's what this stuff stands for, for the blades and handles. And the handles could also, also undergo low-level disinfection. So this is a different comparison of those. So you can see a much lower greenhouse gas emissions profile for the um, reusable here with the sterilization and high-level disinfection. And then cost, too. So this is the cost comparison. So the single-use devices cost a lot more than the disposable devices. If you look at here, $8 difference in the high level and the sterilization of the handle compared with the single use. And this, at 60,000 intubations per year at Yale New Haven Hospital, where the study was done, that's a significant amount of dollar, eight dollars per case. So that was really interesting to see. Uh, and that drove Yale New Haven Hospital to go from disposables back to reusables. And you think about supplies in our budget, this has an enormous budget impact. And a typical perioperative expense budget, supplies are greater than 50% of the budget. That's really interesting because normally um, in other industries like manufacturing stuff like automobiles, they lay off workers really, really fast when the economic situations get tight. But actually 35%, so much lower than supplies, is the salaries and benefits of non-physician staff. And I looked at our anesthesia department and this was even more startling here for us because our supply budget was 63% in 2014, and everything else was 37%. So if we are good stewards of our supplies, we have an enormous opportunity to save uh, not only the environment, but like make a big budget impact. So we've done some things like encouraging people to avoid wasteful setups, like this, for example. Um, somebody set up an IV setup in a, in a pink basin, right? And they opened everything up and flushed it. So you don't know when you walk in the room, did that hit the floor? Is it clean? Is it not clean? So we're advocating, advocating for people to leave things in the package, right? Until the very last minute, then you can open it up later. And we found that we also use more than 32,000 pink basins per year if we use one per case and we can't recycle them anymore. Our, our local recycling vendor won't take them, they used to, and we're trying to avoid them if at all possible. So we've come up with a tray solution for this. 
So just in time opening of disposable supplies for emergency cases too. So we set up our emergency cranny rooms and our trauma rooms with the closed endotracheal tube, closed stylet if you need it, and a reusable um, laryngoscope blade. We put that neatly into a folded towel and the A-line uh, materials also all closed, you know, because once you get word of a case coming, it's, you know, they have to open the room too. They have to set up the room before the patient can come. You have time to put that together. And there are simple steps to doing no harm. So don't open supplies unnecessarily. Favor reusable items if at all possible, and don't open a pulse ox sticker. If you can do one thing, really don't open a sticker, use a clip. Um, of course, if you tuck the arms, you know, or something, you have to use a sticker, use a sticker, but really avoid it for your average case. Pause your gas flows. Use lower flows. This is for your own exposure as well as for the exposure in the environment. And then personally, drive less. If you can drive less, think of what a health benefit that would be for you. Bring your own spoon and cup because these things add up and it really does matter. And you might ask yourself, what is sustainability? Is it just tree hugging? You know, is, but it's about future generations, of course, but also it's about a penny saved is a penny earned. It's really important to think about this and be good stewards of our environment, especially in these times. So we found at UW that we were using disposable GlideScope blades, for example, because um, we went to, in the COVID surge, almost entirely to disposable GlideScopes, thinking, all right, this is what we're gonna have to do as opposed to a, a reusable blade DL. And then our supply chain was really impacted negatively in the surge. We could not get those delivered to us. So then we went back to reusable. So thinking about like infection control, supply chain, particularly in these unusual times is really important. And here is a beautiful park in your area, um, in, in, I was gonna say in Vanderbilt, in Nashville. Um, I hope you enjoy your natural environment and I encourage people to ask questions because there is a prize that we'll talk about in just a moment. So if anybody has any questions, I think you can type them in the chat. And I've seen some things, um, disposable, yeah, I agree. Disposable laryngoscopes is really ridiculous. So, I mean, personally, but really the, the evidence shows that it um, makes a huge impact environmentally and cost-wise. And the infection control risk has not been borne out. Now, if we have a prion uh, diseased patient that we have to do a craniectomy on or something, then in those cases where you cannot sterilize, then I think disposables make a lot of sense. But if you, and not like we have a lot of prion disease here, but we do have, you know, there's mad cow disease in England, but we also have chronic wasting disease in our deer population here in Wisconsin. And we have seen prion uh, infected patients. It's not frequent, maybe like I just one a year um, tops, but that sort of thing, I think disposables make sense. But otherwise, if you think about what is the environment, I mean, we're not even wearing masks for oral surgery cases. So why do we need to have a disposable blade? Doesn't make any sense. Um, cost and time for reprocessing. Yeah, so you have to think about cost and time for reprocessing. Now, of course, it's really important with the push towards disposables over many decades, a lot of hospitals have lost their infrastructure for reprocessing. You need to have people who are trained to do this. You need to have the dishwashers, the literal dishwashers and the humans who do the dishwashing, um, or it's like not dishes, but supply washing and, and packaging, right? That's really important. So it, when you have a JCO visit, you have to make sure that these processes are well established so that you can ensure that it's clean. Because they will ask, so how do you know that this is clean? And for those of you who are older, like I'm at the end of that, of that era where your attending would ask you, so is this clean? So lick it, lick your, lick your blade, Pro prove to me that it's clean, and then you have to go get a new one. So it's kind of disgusting. But um, we then plastics manufacturers, of course, they want to sell something. So they market this to us. And then we have this fear of the Joint Commission and this thought that it might be cheaper. And in the short term, the disposable items are often short-term seductively lower cost, but long-term they really don't bear out. And, we're and sometimes that long-term is only like two to five years. Let's see, reusable LMA is somebody had, yeah, Jayco asked, how do you monitor the number of usages and sterilization, right? So you have to have proper documentation. That's really important, very good point. And every disposable scope has lithium batteries, right? That's really, really um, disturbing. And then they say, so the, the, the companies, that do this, they say, um, well, you can send it back to us for reprocessing. So basically, instead of the raw material to produce their item, we're giving that raw material right back to them that they just clean and repackage. So they say, we reprocess it, and that's great. It does save money over the, the brand new purchase, but think about what you're doing. I mean, really, it's such a, it's such a gimmick, in my opinion, um, or such a racket, that's the word that I'm looking for. Um, 
The impact of volatile anesthetic contaminations in the OR and infertility of OR staff. Yeah, that's really interesting too. So older studies before waste gas scavenging uh, was more modernized and, and pervasive, uh, prevalent like in the late, late 80s and 90s. And they had studies where they looked at infertility and um, also um, early miscarriage rates in anesthesia providers in the operating room. And they found that um, the mutagenic effects were high and the people would have a lot of um, would have the teratogenic effects of these, um, of these agents were studied. Hasn't been studied very recently because of the waste gas scavenging and the low exposure that we now have, but it's important to remember that that's what happened there. So you have to be, have to be careful with what you're using every day. It seems magical. You know, the gas is there, it's gone, but it's not really magic, it is organic chemistry. So think about that. Yes, and OR waste over time and examine per case waste. That's really interesting. So that's what we did with the carbon dioxide emissions. We also looked at, when you mentioned time, we looked at our turnover time because a lot of people will say, okay, well, dust fluorine is quicker. What about your OR time? So of course, because time is money, the operating room is always looking at turnover time and we actually saw a reduction in our turnover time because turnover time is multifactorial. You need to have people who push the carts for patients. You need to have people to mop the floors. You need to have people to set up the room. So um, all of these things, all of these steps, if you don't have a good process, can impact the time in the operating room. But waste over time, so solid waste over time is another thing that can really be studied over per case. But you have to do a lot of, um, it's really difficult at the hospital level to suss out where the waste exactly comes from. So if you think about where the waste goes again, so it leaves your operating room and it goes into a big container and then they wheel it down the hallway. Um, and then it goes to the loading dock where the big dumpsters are and the big dumpsters get picked up and the big dumpsters get filled from the wards, from the cafeteria, from the operating room. So you have to find a way to measure the waste that comes just from the operating room. So we've done some, um, some so this data for, that we have with 67 tons per operating room per year at UW Health comes from uh, waste audits that we do, which are somewhat intensive. So me personally, and some of our environmental services people, we go and we, we have a scale and we measure every bag that comes from the operating room on a couple days a week, and then we do averages and look at that. Minimal multitude drug vials being thrown out after single use. So drug vials, yeah. So drug vials often are glass and glass can be recycled. Now, it really depends on what your vendor will take in your state. So that really local ordinances vary quite a bit and what your vendors will take because they're the ones deciding what will get recycled. So you can say like, this is a very, this is an empty glass, right? Can we recycle this? And uh, not everybody will take that if it has residual drug in it. So some places will say you have to incinerate the entire vial if it has a little bit of drug in it. Um, but the Environmental Protection Agency and the um, Department of Natural Resources also say that if you have less than one, less than 3% content in your vial, that it counts as empty. Because then, so there's a big debate about what's empty and what is not empty, right? Even though you used all the drug that's in it. Is that, what, what do they mean by residual drug? So uh, regulations will vary from state to state, but here in Wisconsin, um, it's 3%. Um, and I believe that 3% is a national number, but it's definitely in Wisconsin, the number, but we have gone to be more conservative at UW Health to a 1% rule. So if you've taken out of a 100, 100 ml vial, everything but one ml, right, then, um, or if there's just a little bit, it's an unmeasurable amount, you can't even aspirate it with your syringe of propofol, we consider that empty. And then the residual drug that's in the syringe has to be incinerated, so that goes into that bin. But the empty vial, if you take the top off, remove the, you know, you can crack the top of the vial off, removing the metal and the plastic or the rubber stopper, you can recycle that vial. So we are able to do that here, but that is always in flux because our recycling vendors are under extreme stress with their um, economic situation considering the plastics ban in China. So you have to confirm with them if they will take your glass vials. Let's see, apply this work to low resource settings. Yeah, so that is really interesting. I think we have, um, we have so many resources where we are, right, compared with other countries and other locations. And I worked at a Shriners Hospital in Massachusetts um, a number of years ago, and because that is all uh, volunteer and donation work, it they were very, very conservative with their drug usage and with their supply usage. They were very like, okay, yeah, this is really important. Safety, of course, was the number one priority, and you're taking care of a child for their spine surgery. And But um, they said, you know, like, let's not open that rock uranium if we're not going to paralyze the patient. Let's do something different. Let's not even open the vial. Um, and that was also in the day when we had all kinds of drug shortages in the paralytics. 
right? And the product of a safety of a system. So this is uh, Nathan's question here. Um, as a trainee, you're taught to open excess stuff, right? For safety, right? And as teachers, you hold the power to reduce that among your trainees. That's very, very true. And you have an enormous impact. So if you think about, again, you might say, oh, it's just this one case, it's this one time, I'm in a rush, this is, this is important. But if you have the habit, like remember in the olden days when people didn't wear gloves to put in IVs because they could feel better? And now we're training everybody wears gloves to put in an IV because you learn to have that feel with gloves, right? Or different habits that you have that are simple that become routine and then don't take up a lot of time. So things like that, um, you can train people to not open things, right? Or to reduce what's open. And again, it's like residents, fear getting yelled at, right? They fear, they're like, oh my gosh, my attending's gonna yell at me and I wanna look good. So um, try to let them know if it's okay with you. So I tell them like, okay, don't open the LMA or the tube because I haven't decided which we're gonna use. I'm gonna talk to Matt, ask if the reflux is well controlled or not, and then we'll decide if we're gonna use the LMA or not. That kind of thing. If we're really worried about reflux, we're not gonna use a Supreme LMA, we're gonna intubate because you know that's really gonna protect you from reflux, that kind of thing. Um, resources, we talked about that one. Nearly every case now, including multiple infusions, right? The ERS protocols, producing drug waste and a lot of plastic, right? It is mind boggling. So thinking about in advance, really, the propofol infusion table um, is really helpful in thinking about how much propofol are you wasting, right? Uh, nonetheless, despite the plastics wastage and despite um, the infusion pump having to be used, and the drug itself has a lower impact than compared with gas. However, there is opportunity to reduce waste with infusions as well. So being mindful of how much are you using. Do you need to use the big bottle? Can you use multiple 20s? How tedious and time consuming is it gonna to be to constantly refill with a 20? You know, that kind of thing. Um, but look, it would be probably worthwhile, maybe if you do a lot of infusions to study that, to think like, can we come up with a table for lidocaine infusions based on the weight of the patient or ketamine infusions? Um, might be really worth studying. What would be a good usage? And how did we get our department to recycle? So that was challenging, um, particularly, so number one is just getting the bins, right? And getting approval from the hospital. And that took a long time. It took like three years of me constantly asking and figuring out who's the right person to ask. So the nursing supervisor has a lot of priorities on his plate. So at that time, our nursing supervisor was, I mean, I just never got a response to my email because he's got staffing problems and safety issues and all that. And I'm just, we're, I'm just asking about recycling never got back to me. And then, um, so I asked like the next people down and the next people up, I'm like, so, you know, I've asked, sent a couple emails now, like, you know, politely nudging, continuously nudging and asking and then talking to environmental services. So what are the barriers to getting a bin in the operating room? Can we do this? It's interesting though. So recycling, the nice thing about it is that it's very visible and it makes people feel good that they can recycle. I mean, not only is the stuff that we use clean, but often it's sterile. So the packaging, right, of what we use, it's just staggering the amount. However, you have to think, will your recycling vendor actually take this packaging? So that's important to clarify as well. So that is time consuming. And then now with the way that the market is, um, recycling isn't uh, very profitable at all anymore. And um, things will change though. They, it will go back and forth. I'm sure this, this will change when we come up with different processes. And currently locally, so we were recycling in anesthesia, but we've taken the anesthesia bins away because people were putting their gloves in them. So you have to constantly monitor this process. And the recycling vendor said, you know, you've got gloves and you're recycling. There's also the, the occasional piece of plastic tubing. What was in that tubing? We can't even take this. So with the, the nurses can recycle on a larger scale. They have a much higher volume of recycling. When they're opening for a, for a sterile case, they have all of those th devices that they open. And that's pre-patient and they, they, they uh, have a process that's very, very good. So, I would say that nurses in the operating room are probably the biggest, um, the biggest uh, group of people that need to be convinced. And once you get them on board, then they will be so helpful to do. Uh, um, recycling bins in the cafeteria and patient care areas. Yeah, and it, so really recycling, you have to think about what is, it's, it's really even more important than recycling is to avoid it. So I find, we found in our cafeteria, we looked at, um, something that we're looking at too is dine in versus carry out. And we found that we have gone to so much and people didn't know this. So when I go to the cafeteria, I could say, hey, can I get that on a plate? And they'd give it to me on a plate. And then at our new hospital on the east side of town, we have a new hospital that has won like LEED Gold certification and um, has a really good environmental processes. And even their cafeteria has gone to this default of a reusable plate and reusable silverware. And only if you take to go, you say, can I get that to go? 
then you get disposable. So they have a lot of reusables and that's an even better, if you look at the pyramid, an even better um, energetic um, component. But before I forget, I wanted to say, and Dr. Hayhurst is gonna have to, um, you have to keep track of this, but there is a prize uh, for the people who ask the first question. So the reusable shopping bag, one of these is gonna get delivered to you in Nashville um, by Dr. Hayhurst. And maybe she can pick uh, the first couple people because I think she got a couple of them from me. And um, I wanted to also put up, this is a vial cap picture. We saved our vial caps and we made a Bucky Badger with a laryngoscope and a tube. And he's hanging in our um, entryway at our department. And I wanna put up the CME code too. I'm going to continue asking, uh, answering questions while we look at the CME code. Let's see. Yeah, the cafeteria uses a ton of styrofoam. So five years ago here, our, um, our, uh, greening the OR, our green hospital group, so a sustainability team, looked at the different processes. We had somebody from um, transportation, people from environmental services, from culinary. Um, I'm the person from the operating room, of course, and some nurses, two from different wards and physicians from other areas. And uh, we made a big initiative push to remove styrofoam. So we don't purchase it at all. And if you get together with people and talk with your cafeteria people, it's a lot of waste, really. And it's going to wind up in your local community. You're going to be having that waste with you for a long, long time. So we've gone to um, paperboard containers entirely, and no styrofoam is purchased in the hospital. And then Roy is asking, uh, I spoke with an admin person re regarding recycling from the OR. Yeah. Right, but contamination comes with a fine, right? So less recycling is desired. So uh, yeah, you dig through the trash, I like it. Um, you examine and look through it, you see tons of contamination in regular recycling bins. So reducing is really a much better, is a much better system than, re than recycling even. If you can recycle, it's good. We've found that you have to be more restrictive with recycling, especially since 2017 with the China plastics ban. Yep, and no one is no one going to go away from single-use things now, especially with coronavirus. So that is a good question, a uh, good comment to make. However, we wound up having to go back to reusable laryngoscope blades and DLing our patients because our supply chain was impacted. So think about that too. So you have the issue with disposable versus reusable and infection control, but if you have good processes in place and you maintain those processes, then you can save a lot of money and um, the infection control risk has not been proven to be better with disposables. So we as providers, like if you imagine surgeons, like the surgeons, they do get dictated some things, but if a surgeon said, no, I am not gonna use this device, you can't give me this piece of crap. We are physicians as well, and we shouldn't say, I cannot, I mean, I can, but this is ridiculous. This, is, this doesn't make sense, and I'm not using it. So we have power that we are under-recognized as physicians, as the expert providers in this area, we should be dictating what we want to use, number one. But also, even if you're somebody who favors disposables, in some cases, you have to think about your supply chain too in this time. During this crisis, we've had a lot of issues with personal protective equipment. I don't know how you guys are with reusing masks, but we're reusing our masks. We're, we're keeping them until they're soiled and reusing them every day. So I've had the same, same mask since, since April, right? I take it off to eat and I put it back on. It stays in my backpack. I bring it with me to work. Um, if it gets ripped or soiled, then I get a new one, and only then. And it's the same thing with our N95s. And we're, um, we haven't gone to um, cloth masks in the hospital, but the community, of course, is using cloth masks because you cannot, for their time period there, you could not buy disposable masks. And that might happen again if we have a surge. Um, and it's happening again in a lot of places around the country that disposable items, they just cannot keep up with the manufacturing. I mean, my God, even toilet paper, I couldn't keep up with the manufacturing. And I mean, obviously, I'm not advocating for reusable toilet paper. But um, at any rate, so you think about what, what can be reused and what is, can safely be reused because the supply chain has been impacted by this as well. Um, relative to red bag medical waste versus other waste. So red bag medical waste is biohazardous, right? So a lot of, or not a lot of, some institutions, um, they put everything that came into patient contact into a red bag waste. And red bag waste is biohazardous and has to be handled separately in a high energy process. So there are only a few processors in every state that can do this and what they do is very costly. So they collect this separately and then um, it gets chopped up and microwaved. So under high energy input and then ultimately put in the landfill. And in some places, red bag waste is incinerated. So here in Wisconsin, it doesn't have to be incinerated but it has to be chopped up of course to break down the glass and the needles and that kind of thing that goes in there. So the needle bins where you put your sharps, right? Gets chopped up. 
and then um, microwave to kill any um, infectious particles that could be in there. And then I'm gonna go back to the pretty picture because it's nice. And then um, the um, and then it gets microwaved to kill. And then it ultimately that chopped up waste goes to the landfill. And then, uh, but it's clean, right? Or not clean, it's at least decontaminated. And then sometimes it gets incinerated. And incinerated waste um, has high energy input as well because you've incinerated it at high temperatures. But pharmaceutical waste in particular, and I don't know if you at Vanderbilt are separating your pharmaceutical waste, but I think most institutions are now too, putting their pharmaceutical waste into a special bin. And that bin is the most expensive bin. And that gets um, not only most expensive, but also highest energy input because it has to get transported to just a handful of locations around the country. So we send our pharmaceutical waste. We used to send it to South Dakota and then to Missouri. And now it actually goes to Texas because that's where our vendor is that takes our pharmaceutical waste incinerated um, the bins and they, they incinerate that. Um, and then that ash from the incineration also has to go to a landfill, right? But then it's associated with high emissions. If you think about the product of burning, I mean, I don't wanna burn that in my backyard. Propofol and halogenated agents, I don't wanna be burning that and breathing that gas. So they have processes that are very energy intensive. It's a high, high temperature that that has to get burned out. Oh, let's see. Uh, oh, some, oh, Roy, you're saving the lithium batteries. <laughs> nice job. Keep those. And uh, I don't know where you can put them, but, um, uh, and do you have anyone who captures the blue wrap? Yeah, so we recycle our blue wrap separately. And we did for some time have a vendor who came, it was our, um, it was our vendor who brought um, linen actually and drove it like we delivered the linen and then drove it to a, a laundry in Milwaukee or something like that. And they were like, we're taking this trip anyway. We could just take your blue wrap. It weighs almost nothing. So we found a cost free um, process. And then we have automobile parts manufacturing in on the Great Lakes coast in um, in Kenosha, Wisconsin. So they were taking that for some time and, and, re and turning that into like non cosmetic automobile parts. So if you've got, you know, a Chevy your dashboard might be made of blue wrap from UW-Madison or have some components in it. Now, however, they got wise to the fact that this is, this is um, something that is valuable to us and so they started charging us, but we're fine with paying for it because we don't want to send our blue wrap to the landfill. And um, there are a lot of things that can be made out of blue wrap. There are places that save the blue wrap and wash them. Um, so that's really interesting to look into blue wrap recycling options. Uh, yep, Refuse is the new addition for me. Thank you, M. Richardson. Um, the push for single-use items, did it come from a legal perspective? No, not legal, but from joint commission and from inspection and from personal fear that a lot of people have that we should go to disposables because it's safer. So this, so really looking at the evidence. So looking at, there is going to be, um, I believe that in the ASA monitor, in the April edition of the ASA monitor um, this year had a very nice um, reusable versus disposable um, discussion about infection control with a lot of good links to other primary literature looking at um, infection control concerns. So that's a lot of the push for people are like, oh, is it clean? Can you prove that it's clean? And I wanna make sure that it's clean. And you gotta ask yourself, how clean does it need to be, number one? And number, like, can it be low level disinfection? Or do we need to sterilize it or does it have to be single use? So considering those different options is really important. And then also, um, also, um, thinking about what is the infection control, what does that literature actually say? So people sometimes have this notion that just because it's disposable, it's automatically cleaner or safer. But you have to think like, do you need to, like do, do you, in your own home, do you use all plastic silverware? You know, do you throw away everything that you use or do you have dishes and spoons and like you lick them and put them in a dishwasher? You know, how dirty is that? And is that process enough for what we're using for certain things like laryngoscopes in particular? Um, Pharma waste processing has other environmental benefits, right? Yeah, you have to. So if so, that's why it's important to minimize the waste. So aquatic um, life and waterways and marine life, you have to not dispose of this pharmaceutical waste elsewhere, right? You cannot just throw it into the sink where it goes into the sewer. Um, you cannot just put it in the landfill. You have to dispose of this properly in order, it has to be incinerated in order to destroy it um, so that it can be disposed of properly. So that's why it's really important to not waste it. So you're right. Um, Nathan, to say that you have to dispose of it properly and put it in the incineration bin. But it's important to think about um, not wasting too much of it. So at the front end, don't get too much. Like don't open it and draw it up if you don't need it because it's ultimately going to be incinerated at a high temperature if you do open it and use it. That's a very good point. 
Are hospitals getting sued over infection transmission? Are you in favor of legal reform to, to protect hospitals and providers? Whoa, so that's a question I don't really know much about. And how do you change Jayco's mind? But that's a really good question. They're pretty rigid and it doesn't matter what we think, it's what they think. Okay, now, um, this is important. So we have had conversations at our hospital when we have a joint commit, because we do have a fair amount of reusables. We actually had reusable linen for a very long time in the operating room and uh, went through multiple Jayco um, visits with our reusable surgical linen, but we had a good process in place. And then very recently for a little bit of money, Medline said, you know, we can, we can do this cheaper for you with disposables, which was sort of tragic, but we had nonetheless said the long-term benefit of linen is better. And then we had an infrastructure problem in our region. So we have a number of hospitals in our region and they were all sending their linen to either Milwaukee or Madison. And in Madison, um, our laundry was getting pretty overwhelmed because in Northern Illinois, a laundry in Rockford, Illinois shut down and we were unable to reprocess our linen anymore. And so they said, we have to do away, we can do a disposable option for surgical linen, which was really sad. So if you think about all of the infrastructure that's involved in the market of producing things for the operating room, that has, a, the market has a big, big, big impact on what you can do for reusable versus disposable. And think about too, in this crisis, how they're fast tracking all kinds of things. They're like, all right, we're going to fast track approval for this drug, we're gonna fast track approval for this vaccine, to try to, the FDA, which is so conservative and slow and unwieldy, they're doing things quickly. So things can be done where we're finding more flexibility in systems than we ever thought could possibly exist. And with your expert opinion, with our expert knowledge, and saying, no, we, this doesn't make sense. So ask the JCO people, ask the, ask the site visitors, talk with them, and they say, well, how do you prove that this is clean? And say, well, let me look into that. Don't just throw out the baby with the bathwater, right? The, throw out the whole process for one small issue. Look into the process. They're often satisfied with good documentation in particular. So that makes a huge difference if you're able to do that. Yeah, time is up, Josh. Goodbye. <laughs> it's nice to see you all. I'm, it's very exciting to talk with you all. And I'm sure that uh, Dr. Hayhurst will be in touch. If you have any questions, um, let me know. There's a ways to get a hold of me. Um, the ASA Environmental Task Force has a website too that you can go to. So you Google that and most people are ASA members. Um, and we have a greening the OR document too. Thank Here. you so much, that was excellent. I will find the first couple people with the questions and give them your back. Good, nice. Good to see you all and have a great day.